Hey everyone, and welcome to another one of my weekly art videos. I hope you're having an amazing day wherever you are in the world. And thanks so much for joining me on this one. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing a beginner-friendly drawing and watercolor painting exercise. I am going to be taking you step-by-step step through sketching and painting a hot air balloon with watercolor. This is going to be an awesome exercise for anyone just getting started with watercolor because we get to practice our color mixing and keeping our color mixtures organized on our palettes as we're painting. And we also get to practice our water and our brush control. These are all super important skills that are gonna come in very handy as we move on to painting more challenging things. We're gonna be practicing wet on wet and wet on dry techniques. And I'm also going to be sharing a simple way that you can create the illusion of clouds. With all that said, let's go ahead and jump in. All right, so let's get started with our preliminary outline sketch so that we can then move on to our watercolor practice. Now, I am sketching this hot air balloon from imagination. I am not looking at any specific reference photo or anything like that. First thing that I do is I place a few tick marks on my watercolor sheet. I place two tick marks to decide how tall the hot air balloon is going to be, and I place two to decide how wide the hot air balloon is going to be. These tick marks tell me where the balloon is going to be at its widest and at its tallest. This is a great way to make sure that my hot air balloon is not going to be too small or too large and that it's going to be centered within my watercolor sheet. So I'm able to better use my space more effectively. Once these tick marks are in, instead of trying to go in and create a perfect shape for my hot air balloon or even creating perfect curves, what I like doing is visualizing that shape created by that hot air balloon and laying down a combination or a series of straight lines focusing on laying down those lines at the angles that I need in order to create that overall shape that I need. I'm making sure to draw nice and light. I don't wanna press down my pencil too hard on my watercolor sheet because I wanna be able to refine my drawing as I go and do any erasing that I might need to do. I do want to make sure that I'm creating a symmetrical shape as much as possible. So whatever I do on the left, I try to flip so that I can create a mirrored version of those angles on the right. Once I'm happy with that overall blocky shape, I do any refinements that I might need to do. I curve lines a little bit more, connect those lines a little bit more if needed. And I'm now going in with a kneaded eraser to do some gentle tapping over my pencil work to clean up my sketch a little bit and make it look even lighter. Once I'm done with that, it's gonna be time to start adding in the bottom part of the hot air balloon and the basket hanging down. So the first thing that I do is I create a curve. From this perspective, we're able to see a little bit into the hot air balloon. So I make sure to erase out that straight line that I had at the bottom and create a curve. Once I have that curve going up, I go ahead and add a smaller curve right beneath it. I then connect these two lines with two slanted lines on either side. Then I add another curve beneath these two, and this time it's going down so that it can visually create that oval shape in the bottom of the hot air balloon. This oval shape would actually be the hole that we can see partially into. And for that basket, I visualize a rectangular prism or a box. You can see how I've added that bottom plane. From this perspective, we're able to see into the hot air balloon and we're also able to see that bottom plane of this box. I have to make sure that once I've picked a perspective that I keep that perspective consistent throughout the entire drawing. Even though I'm not going for a super realistic result here, I do want the perspective to look believable. Once that box was in, I connected the hot air balloon to the basket with four straight lines, and then it was time to start adding in the actual design for the hot air balloon. Now, if you've checked out any of my past sketching tutorials that I've shared, you probably already know 
but I start from largest general shapes and I make my way towards smaller shapes and details. So what I did was I started by separating out this large general hot air balloon shape into medium sized shapes. And then inside of these medium sized shapes, I'm going to be creating the smaller shapes. As you're adding in those medium sized shapes, which would be the vertical stripes, if you want to see them as vertical stripes, it's so important to bring to mind and consider the area of the hot air balloon that is roundest or widest. The widest sections of these quote unquote stripes should go hand in hand with the widest area of the overall general hot air balloon structure or shape. And then the quote unquote stripes become more narrow as they make their way toward the top and toward the bottom of the hot air balloon. Once those five medium sized shapes were in, I started breaking those medium sized shapes up into smaller shapes. And I wanted to bring in that zigzag or triangular type design that I had seen before in photos of hot air balloons. Oftentimes with something like this, it's easier for me to start with the middle medium sized shape. So in this case, it would be this stripe right in the middle that I'm starting to break up into smaller shapes using these angled lines. As I continue drawing in these angled lines and creating these smallest shapes in this hot air balloon design, I'm making sure to leave a little bit more space in between my lines in that widest, largest portion of the hot air balloon. And I'm leaving a little bit less space in between them in the more narrow sections of these stripes. Once again, bringing to mind that my macro level structure of the hot air balloon. Once I have created these smallest shapes in the stripe in the middle, it's easier for me to break up the other stripes to the left and to the right of that one into these smaller shapes. Okay, so with my outline sketch created, it is time to choose my colors and prepare my color mixtures that I'm going to be using to paint this hot air balloon. So because this is going to be a color mixing exercise for beginners, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using the three primary colors. I'm going to be choosing a red, a yellow, and a blue. And with these three primaries, I'm going to be creating my secondary color mixtures. And I'm going to be using these colors in order or in a specific sequence as I am painting in my hot air balloon. This said, you're completely free to use whichever colors you want to use to paint in your hot air balloon. I'd recommend picking colors that you want to explore or practice mixing together. And this is still going to be an excellent exercise because whatever colors it is that you choose to explore, you can still get great practice keeping your color mixtures organized on your palette, practicing water control and brush control, and practicing keeping your colors as vibrant and clean as possible by rinsing out your paintbrush bristles effectively in between colors, and also making sure that you are keeping an eye on your water and changing it whenever you find it's getting too much murky because that can also affect the vibrancy of your colors. The three primary colors that I went with are Pyrrole Red from Daniel Smith and Windsor Lemon and French Ultramarine from Windsor & Newton's professional line. What you're seeing me create right now are my secondary color mixtures. First, I created my orange by mixing together my red and my yellow. Then I created my purple by mixing together my red and my blue. And then I mixed my green by mixing together my yellow and my blue. As you can see, I am keeping my warmer colors separate from my cooler colors on my color mixing palette. This is going to be very helpful for me when it comes to keeping colors vibrant and clean in my hot air balloon 
because if you mix colors that are complementary colors in the color wheel, meaning opposite to each other in the color wheel, or a warm color and a cool color together, you can really risk starting to create muddiness or desaturated colors. And right now I'm looking for more saturated, lively colors. So wherever it is that you're creating your color mixtures and whatever kind of design it is that your mixing palette has, think of a way to keep your color mixtures organized on your mixing palette. If warm colors start intermixing a little bit with each other, or cooler colors start intermixing a little bit with each other, it's not that big of a deal. You can just add in a little bit more of this color or that color to make it more of the color that you need. But if your warm and cool colors start intermixing, that can be an issue. Red plus green is going to create a brown. Orange plus blue is going to create a brown. Yellow plus purple is going to create a brownish grayish color. It depends on the specific primaries that it is that you are mixing together and also the amounts of each color that you're mixing together. But you're going to be muting down your color or desaturating it or even arriving at grays or browns if you mix enough of those two colors together. All right, so I'm pretty happy with these three primaries and the secondaries that these three primaries create. I went ahead and changed my water so that I could start with a clean container and it's time to go ahead and get started with the painting process. To paint in the hot air balloon, I'm going to be using two different brushes. They are both round brushes. One of them is a size 10 and the other is a size 3. I'm just going to be switching between them depending on the size of the area that I'm going to be painting in. Right now, the consistencies of these color mixtures on my palette are somewhere between a coffee to milk-like consistencies, which means that I have somewhere around 50% paint, 50% water in them. And I do want to make sure that initially I'm going in with a paint consistency that is a little bit more watered down maybe somewhere between the tea to coffee-like consistency. And so what I'm gonna be doing as I'm initially using all of these color mixtures is I'm bringing out a few drops of water from my container into that color mixture. I swivel that paintbrush in that mixture to get it a little bit more watered down. And then I go in with just a small amount of that paint in my paintbrush. This is so that I don't go in super dark and thick right off the bat. If I go in with my colors very thick and very dark, I'm likely going to arrive at very heavy results, some very flat results, especially because we're painting on dry paper right now, which means that that paint is not going to expand out because we haven't pre-wetted our paper with water or anything like that. The paint that we place on paper is gonna stay tight and constricted in that shape that you're painting in. It's not gonna dissipate and expand out and soften the way that it does when we apply watercolor on paper that is wet. It's better if I go in initially to paint in that shape with a pretty light layer, and then once that initial layer is painted in, I can drop in a little bit more color into sections that I'm looking to darken a little bit more. This will help create at least a small range of values in all of these sections that we're painting in in this hot air balloon which is going to lead to more dimension at the end and also more glow and more lightness. Remember that when we're painting with watercolor we're using that lightness and the brightness of the paper under the paint as part of the painting to help us bring dimension and glow into the piece. And we're playing with the medium's translucency to help us create that glowing effect. As you can see, even with the painting, I go in and get started with this middle stripe in this hot air balloon design. And then I move on to painting the other sections of the hot air balloon. This simplifies the process for me, especially because there is a specific sequence or pattern that I'm following with my colors as I'm painting all of this in. So once I've decided on the sequence or order of my colors in this middle stripe, it's gonna make the placement of my colors next to them easier. I'm gonna have that figured out. But even with that, with this kind of exercise, just like with color wheel exercises, it is important to continue paying attention to where you're painting in all of your colors because there is a specific sequence. But what I did first was I painted in my first primary color shapes in this middle stripe in the hot air balloon. 
And as you can see, I left empty spaces or shapes in between these or above these. And this is because these empty shapes are going to be filled in or painted in with the secondary colors. By skipping spaces or leaving empty spaces in between the shapes that I am painting in, I'm also making sure that those shapes have dried before I paint in that shape right next to it or beside it. This is important because if I paint in a shape that's right next to or below a shape that I just painted in that is still wet, what's going to happen is that that new color that I start painting in is going to start bleeding or merging into the previous one or the previous one is going to start bleeding or merging into this new color. And don't get me wrong, bleeding can be a beautiful effect that I sometimes use intentionally in fuller pieces. But for this specific exercise, I don't want much bleeding happening. And whenever I'm not looking for any bleeding, it's just a matter of seeing how you can jump around the piece to make sure that that previous section you just painted in has dried before painting in that section right next to it. So it's just a matter of creating a little plan for yourself. And even when you do want bleeding to happen, you also need to create a little plan for yourself because if you want bleeding to happen, then you have to make sure that that previous section is still wet. So you have to create a strategy for yourself to make sure that you are painting in that next section while that initial section is still wet. Going in with a strategy and a general, at least loose plan is incredibly important whenever you're looking for specific effects. So when it comes to the secondary colors for this middle stripe, I started with that purple right above the red, and then in between the red and the yellow, I painted in the orange, which would be the secondary color that would be created by mixing together red and yellow. Then in between the yellow and blue primaries, I painted in the green secondary, which would be the secondary color mixture that is created when you mix together yellow and blue. And then in between the blue and the red, I filled in with purple, which would be the secondary that is created by mixing together the red and blue primaries. And finally, I filled in that last secondary color, which would be the orange, that would be created with the colors right above that and right beneath that, which are red and yellow. So essentially, the secondary colors sit in between the primary colors that would create them. As I've been moving along painting in all of these sections, I've continued making sure that my color mixtures are staying somewhat organized on my palette. I'm making sure to completely rinse out my paintbrush bristles in between my colors so that I don't pollute the next. I've continued making more of each color mixture as needed as I've continued on and making sure that I'm not going in and painting in very thick dark color right away. And I'm also making sure to just do what I can to stay on top of water control. These shapes that we're painting in are relatively small, so we don't want to go in with way too much water. And if you feel you need to switch to a smaller brush as you make your way down the hot air balloon or upward, make sure to do that as well. As I was painting in that blue shape in that middle stripe, I did have to go in and do a little bit of absorbing of excess water that was sitting in that small shape. So what I did after painting in that blue shape was I removed all of that color and excess water from my paintbrush bristles and I use my paintbrush bristles as a little absorbent sponge to remove that excess water that was sitting there. So I was left with a little bit of a splotch or a whitish area in that middle blue shape. I'll be fixing that later by adding another layering on top after that blue shape has dried. It is very important when something like this happens to just go in, do a little bit of lifting, absorbing of excess water or paint, and you can very easily fix that kind of small mistake later after everything has dried. If you go in and start layering too much paint or doing too much scrubbing or lifting, you might end up with overworked results. So it's best to just allow that to dry, take a step back, and later on you can fix mistakes with another light glaze on top. Or darkening certain sections within that shape or whatever it is that you need to do to make that mistake less visible. 
but it's important to have patience and know when to stop, especially when it comes to working with watercolor, where it's so easy to start overworking everything and making everything flat. After working on other sections of the hot air balloon, that blue shape that I wanted to fix had dried, so I take a quick second to do another layer of blue over that shape and develop a little bit of a range of values within that blue shape with the second layer. And that completely disappears that splotchiness that I had accidentally created. After painting in that middle stripe, you can see how I painted in those first three primaries in the central section of the other stripes to the left and to the right of that. And you can see how the sequence is the same. I started with the red at the top, then I skipped one, then I did the yellow, then I skipped another one, then I did the blue. And that's going to help me get started with painting in these other stripes. And the sequence for the secondaries is, of course, also going to be the same because the secondaries are always going to fall above, below, or in between the primaries that create the secondaries. Only these stripes to the left and to the right of that central one that we started with are going to be slightly shifted down. So the new color that you're going to be painting in is the same as the one that is kind of diagonal to that one above it. Um, that is the color that you're painting in in this empty new shape. So always notice what color is above and to the left or above and to the right in a diagonal and that's the color that you should be painting in in this new space. If you're painting in those empty spaces on the left half of the hot air balloon, you're paying attention to the color of the shape that is above it and to the right. And if you're painting in the right half of the hot air balloon, then you're paying attention to what color the shape is that is above and to the left. I'm going to continue working on filling in all of these empty spaces that I have, paying attention to the sequence and making sure to completely rinse out my paintbrush bristles in between each color. One other thing that you might have already noticed that I'm constantly doing is I am dabbing the tip of my paintbrush onto my absorbent towel that I have right there to my left. And this is in order to get rid of any excess water that I might have either on my painting that I'm absorbing up from my painting and just then blotting it on my absorbent towel to remove that excess color or water. Or whenever I go into my container to rinse out my paintbrush bristles, I tend to not only gently scrape the bristles on the top of my container, the top lip of my container to remove that excess strippage, but I also often dab the tip of my paintbrush on my absorbent towel after rinsing out my brush so that I don't bring out way too much water into my color mixtures because every single time you go into your container of water your paintbrush is absorbing some amount of water at least and you're bringing out water into your color mixtures. Watercolor paintbrushes are made to absorb and hold water in their bristles and the larger the brush of course the more water it absorbs and is able to hold. If we're not careful and we don't pay attention to how much water we're bringing into our color mixtures, we're likely going to find very soon into the process that our color mixtures are way too watery on our palette. This can lead us to start losing control of our color mixtures on our palette or simply to those colors being way too pale. So throughout this painting process, just continue noticing the consistencies of your color mixtures on your palette and consider adding more paint into those color mixtures if they're becoming way too watery to thicken them up a little bit more. Okay, so I'm all done with painting that first layer of color all throughout the hot air balloon design. And what I am going to do now is I'm going to prepare my color mixtures that I'm going to be using to paint in the basket. And for this, I'm going to be creating a few different puddles of more neutral colors. 
So you can see how I'm using this other side of my palette here, this other mixing area. And this is to avoid placing these neutral or brown or gray color mixtures right next to my brighter, more saturated mixtures that I use for the actual balloon itself. If browns and neutrals start mixing together with the brighter colors, you're again going to be muting them down and desaturating them. So I make sure to create these on the opposite side so that they don't reach each other. The first puddle of color that I prepared for myself is just plain raw sienna with water added in. The second puddle is plain burnt sienna with water added in. And this third color mixer that I'm creating is a grayish brown that I am creating by mixing together French ultramarine and burnt sienna. If you mix together approximately a 50-50 amount of blue and brown, you're gonna get a gray. If your blue and brown color mixture has more blue than brown in it, it's gonna look like a dark grayish blue. And if it has more brown than blue in it, it's gonna look like a dark grayish brown. I was looking for something in between, kind of a 50-50 amount of each, so that I could get more of a gray color for those strings or the rope that is going to be connecting the basket to the hot air balloon. Once I have those color mixtures ready, I go ahead and switch on over to my size three round brush to paint in these small shapes. First, I paint in that kind of ring circular section right under the hot air balloon design. I paint in a single layer of raw sienna first, and while that initial lighter beigeish brown is still wet, I go ahead and drop in a little bit of my burnt sienna to darken little sections and create a little bit of a range of values within this shape. You can see how I had nice soft transitions between my colors, and this is because I made sure to drop in my burnt sienna while that initial layer of raw sienna was still wet. I do the same thing for the rectangular prism or the box or basket. I paint in that raw sienna layer first and while that raw sienna is still wet, I drop in a little bit of my burnt sienna into certain sections that I'm looking to darken, especially that bottom plane of the rectangular prism that is facing away from the light source, which in this case would be of course the sun. I still have to paint in that whole section that we can see into uh, from this perspective and I still have to paint in those strings or rope but I don't want to do that right now because as I said before if I paint in those shapes or lines while these shapes that I just painted in are still wet I'm going to get bleeding happening and I'm not looking for bleeding right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work in other sections of the piece, I'm going to allow that to dry, and then I'll come back to that later to paint those missing sections or elements in. So what I'm going to be doing in the meantime is I'm going to be developing a second layer or glaze, if you will, only in some of these colorful shapes where I've already created that first layer of color. I'm using the same color that I had used in that shape. It's relatively watered down and I'm going in with my size 10 round brush. And this is just with the objective of developing at least a slight range of values in some of these shapes that I already painted in, which are looking a little bit flat to me. This is gonna help add dimension and a more believable look overall to the hot air balloon. Something we have to remember is that watercolor usually dries lighter than how it looks when it's wet. And going in and darkening certain sections in some of these shapes is gonna help create that slight or little range of values. By doing a little bit of layering or overlapping of the same color in certain sections, I am darkening certain sections and just creating that range of values where I have little lighter areas and darker areas, and that is going to lead to less flatness. I'm not going into every single shape, and in the shapes that I am going into, I'm not looking to go in and darken the entire shape. I'm only looking to darken certain sections of those shapes. Once again, so that inside of that shape I have some lighter areas and some darker areas. Because I'm doing this painting on dry paper, I'm being left with sharp defined edges around these little shadow shapes or darker value shapes that I am painting in. 
So whenever I want to soften the edge, I simply remove that paint from my paintbrush bristles. I go back in with a clean and slightly damp brush, run my paintbrush bristles over the edge that I'm looking to soften while that paint is still wet, and that's going to help soften that edge. Okay, so I'm all done with that. I'm gonna take a quick second to paint in that whole section that I had left before. And I'm also going to be darkening the bottom of the basket, the bottom plane facing away from the light. To paint in that whole section, I used that French Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna color mixture. That mixture that I used did have a little bit more Burnt Sienna in it than French Ultramarine, so it looks a little bit more like a darker brown. I used my size 3 round brush because it's a pretty small shape. Then I added a little bit more Burnt Sienna into my color mixture to get it a little bit lighter, and I darkened the bottom section of that rectangular prism, that basket, a little bit more. And with that, it was time to start painting in the sky. So for this, the first thing that I do is I create my color mixtures that I'm gonna be needing for my sky. The colors that I'm gonna be using for my sky are cobalt blue and quinacridone rose. I'm gonna be using plain cobalt blue for certain sections of my sky. And then I'm gonna be creating a mixture of cobalt blue and quinacridone rose to add in a little bit of a hint of purple here and there in a very irregular way throughout that sky, just so that I can have a variety of both hue and value throughout my sky to add a little bit more color and interest. I'm making sure that the color mixtures on my palette are somewhere around 50% paint, 50% water, because I am going to be doing pre-wetting for my sky area before dropping in my color. So I don't want to go in super light and watery because there's already going to be some amount of water content on my paper that is going to be added to the water content in the mixtures. But another thing that I'm making sure to do is I'm making sure to create enough of both of these color mixtures on my palette before starting to paint because this is a relatively large area that we're going to be painting in and I'm looking for soft diffused out wet on wet effects and gradients throughout my sky and if I don't have enough of these color mixtures ready on my palette and I have to create more of these color mixtures when I am painting in this large space then I can run the risk of certain sections starting to dry on me as I am creating more of these color mixtures to use. And I don't want that to happen. So make sure that the consistency of your color mixtures is what you need it to be, somewhere between a coffee to milk-like consistency would be good. And also make sure that you have enough of your color mixtures for the sky that you're going to be painting in next. Another thing that I would recommend is having some type of absorbent towel on hand for the cloud painting technique that we're going to be using. I'm going to be using a regular kitchen paper towel. I think I like the outcome better when I use a regular kitchen paper towel for that technique versus the absorbent towel that I usually have on hand for my watercolor painting. Once I have created those two color mixtures, my cobalt blue and my cobalt blue plus quinacridone rose, I switch on over to using my size 6 mop brush. This is a nice absorbent large brush. You could also use something like a 1 inch flat brush if you don't have a mop brush. This mop brush that I am using is essentially a large round brush and not be left with too much texture because you have to reload your paintbrush over and over again and that previous section that you painted in starts drying on you and then you have sharp and defined edges. With a larger brush, you're able to load up a good amount of paint and water and paint more quickly. But before painting in that color, as you can see, I'm doing pre-wetting with clean water all throughout this area. When it comes to painting backgrounds or large areas like this, 
I really like doing pre-wetting with clean water because it helps me do two things. First of all, it helps me expand the working time that I have. Because when we're painting with watercolor, if we're painting on dry paper, things are going to dry pretty quickly. Dry paper is thirsty paper. So whatever paint you place on it, it's going to start absorbing pretty quickly and everything is going to start drying on you pretty quickly. Which means that if you don't work fast and if you don't have a good amount of water control, things can start drying very quickly and you can be left with a lot of texture where you weren't looking for texture. And when you're painting in large areas like this one, it can just be very stressful because you might feel like you're racing against the clock. Whereas if you pre-wet that area effectively using clean water and gently going over everything a few times until you arrive at that nice even sheen, because that paper is not thirsty anymore, you have a little bit more working time where you can drop in more color, move that color around as needed, get rid of any little textures that you don't like, do lifting if you've dropped in way too much color, etc. And you don't have to race against the clock as much. And the second thing that that water content that we prepare the paper with helps us do is it does half of the work for us in terms of creating those soft wet on wet effects because as I said before paint is going to expand into paper that is wet on its own so it really helps us create those soft effects in skies so after taking my time with that pre-wetting process i go ahead and start dropping in my sky colors starting with the cobalt blue after i have added in some amount of cobalt blue i go ahead and start dropping in the purple for all of this, I continue using my larger mop brush. You can see how I left little sections that kind of look like clouds already because I have plenty of that paper shining through or the color simply looks lighter. That is exactly what I want for my sky. I'm not looking for an even flat wash. I'm looking for a variety of tones or values throughout my sky and also a variety in hue. Some areas look a little bit bluer and other areas look more purple. Right here I am going to be doing a little bit of cleanup work. Everything is still pretty wet and workable but after having added in a good amount of paint all throughout the background I'm going to take a quick second to go in with a clean and slightly damp brush to bring that paint a little bit closer to the edges of my hot air balloon. Because I've been moving pretty quickly as I've been painting in that background, I had a little bit of an outline effect around my hot air balloon where the white paper was showing too much. Once I did that, I drop in a little bit more color in areas that I want to intensify a little bit more. Everything is still wet and workable because I took my time with that pre-wetting process. If sections of my sky were already starting to dry, I wouldn't be adding more paint into the sky because that is just going to lead to splotchiness. I'm making sure to work relatively quickly because I still need to lift up those clouds while my paint is still wet. If the paint starts to dry, I'm not going to be able to do that cloud painting technique. Once I'm pretty happy with how my background is looking, I go ahead and take my regular kitchen paper towel, I crumple it up in my hands, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be pressing down this paper towel onto that paint that is still wet to lift up some of that color. So this is a negative painting technique that allows us to easily create the illusion of clouds in the sky. We're removing color instead of adding. As I continue pulling out more clouds, I continue observing how much paint has collected in that section of the paper towel that is coming into contact with the paper. Once I notice that there is plenty of paint collected there, I shift the paper towel in my hand and crumple it up again so that I can go in with another fresh clean section to do more lifting. 
I want a lot of irregularity in these clouds. I don't want to create a patterny or very organized look. I want a variety in shape, a variety in size, in location. I don't want anything to look too patterny or organized. It is very easy to go overboard with adding in way too many clouds, so I continue coming back to see everything as a whole and really asking myself if more clouds are really necessary. I also bring to mind that clouds that are higher up in the sky should be taller and larger than the clouds that are closer to where the horizon line would be. So when I add in my clouds lower in the picture plane, I try to make them more flat or more narrow, smaller than the clouds that I add above. If you start doing your lifting for your clouds and you see them initially but then they kind of disappear, it probably means that your paint is still very, very wet. And if you wait a little bit longer, just a few seconds more and try again, they're probably going to be more visible if you wait a little bit longer. You see, when the paint is still very wet, it's still moving around a lot on its own. And if you just allow that paint to settle a tiny bit longer, and then try again, those clouds are probably going to be more visible. Just don't allow the paint to dry completely because if you do, you're not gonna be able to lift up that paint anymore. After I painted in my sky and my clouds, I allowed everything to dry completely and it was time to paint in those lines for that rope that is connecting the basket to the hot air balloon. I always leave this kind of detail where I'm kind of more painting in a line until the very end. And I'm using my size three round brush and my brownish gray color mixer that I created by mixing together French ultramarine and burnt sienna. You can see me soften these lines by going in with my absorbent towel and just doing a little bit of lifting. I definitely don't want these lines to be super stark looking or distracting for the viewer. Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, make sure to check out everything that I am offering over at my Patreon membership website, because for a very small amount a month, you're going to get immediate access to my exclusive tutorials, classes, and resources that I don't share anywhere else. All of these exclusive tutorials include my downloadable outline sketches so that you don't have to start from scratch, reference photos, and my supply lists. There's already a library of over 75 sketching and watercolor painting tutorials that are real time, meaning they are not sped up or edited. They are fully narrated and I take you through my entire process, making sure to explain everything as clearly as possible step by step. Two new exclusive full length tutorials are added into this exclusive library every single month. For those of you who are interested in really taking your artwork to the next level and want to know all of the inside secrets that I learned about in art school and courses that I've invested in myself, there's also a full library on classes on art fundamentals in which all of the bases are covered. That library has now over 35 classes and workshops all have assignments at the end that help you actually put your knowledge to the test. And there's a brand new class or workshop added at the beginning of every single month. As if all of this weren't enough, you also get a weekly sketchbook prompt sent to your inbox to help you stay consistent with your art practice. There's a live training, workshop, or paint along session with me every single month. Members in the $15 tier and upwards get access to thorough feedback from me on their work whenever they need it, and much, much more. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things, which you can choose from depending on your goals and needs needs. So go ahead and check it out. I'm going to make sure to leave a link where you can find out more down below in the description box of this video. And I would love, love, love to get to know more about you and your work and have you join this innermost art community of mine.